Please open to page 250 in your student journal. In section 8.2, we're going to continue graphing our quadratic functions. Remember, quadratic function means the highest exponent of the variable is a 2. And when we graph our quadratic functions, we're going to get a parabola, which is the U-shaped graph that we saw in section 8.1. In section 8.1, we focused on graphing quadratic functions of the form ax squared. The a value we discovered, if it was larger than 1, we noticed it made our graph vertically stretch. If the a value was smaller than 1, it made our graph vertically shrink or compress. And if the a value was negative, it made our graph vertically reflect, aka flip upside down. Now we're going to extend on that and now instead of just having ax squared we're now going to see what happens if we add or subtract a value from our x squared term. So let's start off by graphing our parent function. Remember our parent function is the simplest form of our function so in this case, we just have x squared. We're not adding or subtracting anything. We're not multiplying by anything. It's just plain x squared. Also remember, if this f of x bugs you, remember that's the same thing as y equals. Let's go ahead and graph our parent function. Just make a quick xy chart. If I put negative 1 in for x, if I square negative 1, I get 1. If I square 0, I get 0. If I square 1, I again get 1. So let's go ahead and graph. Now if we want a little bit better idea of what this graph looks like, let's try negative 2 and 2. Remember our graph is symmetric. So if I square 2, I get 4. If I square negative 2, I'll also get 4. Remember, our graph is symmetric, so if I fold my graph in half, on the axis of symmetry, the two sides should match up. So here's our parent function, our y equals x squared. Now we want to see what happens when we graph x squared plus 2. make another little xy chart and I'm going to enter in the same values that I did for when we had x squared. So now when I substitute my values in I get negative 2 squared plus 2. Remember when you're squaring a negative in your calculator you have to put parentheses around it. Negative 2 squared anytime I square negative I get a positive. negative 1 squared. I get a positive 1. 0 squared. I just get 0. Remember our graph is symmetric. So without redoing all the computation, I know the other points on my graph. Or I can simply graph the first part of my graph and then place points that are mere images of the other ones. So here's the first half of my graph. If I have a point at negative 1, 3, I also have a point that's its mere image on the other side, which happens to be at 1, 3. Negative 2, 6, that's 2 away from the axis of symmetry, so there's a point 2 away from the axis of symmetry on the right side of the graph. Now I know as you look at this graph, you might be thinking, wait, Miss Scott, it looks like the graph got skinnier. 
Well, the graph really didn't get any skinnier or any wider. The graph really moved up two places. Look at all of our ordered pairs. Zero, zero went up to zero, two. One, one became one, three. So all of our points just moved up two. I know it gives the illusion be like it's skinnier because it looks like it's inside the other one, but it really has just been moved up two. So adding two on caused our graph to move up two. Now the fancy way to say that, and I do want you to know the proper vocab, it's a vertical translation up two. To be very honest with you, if you are able to tell me that that graph moves up too, I am fine with that. I just want to make sure that we've at least heard the proper terminology. So if and when you do take Algebra 2 and your Algebra 2 teacher talks about a vertical translation, you've at least heard of it before. But again, I am fine with you being able to tell me that the graph has moved up too. Let's take a look at another graph, and I want to simplify this a little bit. Get rid of the 2 in front of the x squared in both of those functions. So now what we have left is just our parent function again. So I'm going to go ahead and graph that. It's the same as our table up above. And now I want to see what happens when now we have our parent function and we take away 2. We now have a minus 2. So let's use the same values so it's easier to compare. Negative 2 squared minus 2. 4 minus 2 gives me a 2. Negative 1 squared will be 1 minus 2. 0 squared is 0. Now, if you want to, you can keep going and you can do all the computation. But notice, this graph is symmetric. So if you really wanted to, if you wanted to simplify things, you could do the computation for the positive part of the table first if you'd like. You don't have to worry about squaring the negatives. So now when we graph, graph our ordered pairs, We have to be very careful again on our observations. If we look too quick, we're going to say, oh, Miscali, that graph got wider. It's wider than our parent function. Well, it's actually not any wider than our parent function. It's the same width. It's the same shape. The only difference is our graph has been moved down two places. So if you look, 0, 0, is now at 0, negative 2. It's been moved down 1, 2 boxes. 1, 1 has been moved down 1, 2 boxes. 2, 4 has been moved down 1, 2 boxes. So subtracting off the 2 is once again a vertical translation, but now we're going down 2. Again, vertical translation is the proper vocab for this, proper terminology that I at least want you to have heard of. I am fine, quizzes and tests, if you tell me that the graph has been moved down too for the transformation. So let's just take a second at the bottom of the page and summarize.
This is the form that we started with back at the top. And your book calls this C. Let me make that fix real quick. So when we add a number onto our squared term, it caused a vertical translation up, and we just put C units. So whatever number C happens to be, that's how many we would move up. Now if we happen to subtract, we still had a vertical translation, but we went down, and again we're just going to say C units, and C again is just whatever that number happens to be that we are adding or subtracting, whatever that number happens to be, is how many units we move up or down on our graph. So let's go ahead and turn to page 253 in our student journals. There are four questions on page 253, and we're not going to graph all of these. What I want us to focus on is the transformation. So comparing it to our parent function of x squared. So what I'd like you to do is take a couple minutes and go through and just list for me the different transformations. So for example, question number one, what would adding five do to our graph? Would it be a, here are your options, I'll list them off to the side for you. Is it a vertical stretch? Is it a vertical shrink or a compression? Is it a vertical reflection? Is it a vertical translation? And with the vertical translation, is it up? Or is it down? And how many units up or down? So let's get specific on that. So take a little pause here. I want you to look at each of the four questions and see if you can list out for me all the transformations. And I have that list for you off to the side over here. All right, so let's take a look at number one. Number one, we have just plain x squared plus five. Adding 5 onto our squared term causes a vertical translation. And we want to be specific. Adding 5 causes it to go up 5. Once again, if all you put for this was up 5, I am fine with that. You want to get used to that specific terminology? You're more than welcome to use that too. Question two, we just have a plain x squared, and we have a minus three. Subtracting three will cause a vertical translation, and we want to be specific. Subtracting causes my graph to go down, and we want to be specific that it goes down three. Once again, if all you put for this transformation was down three, I'm perfectly fine with that. As we move on to question three, now we have more than just subtracting two. We have a negative three times our x squared. The negative three times x squared, that looks like something from section 8.1. So here's a great review opportunity for us. Let's start with what the negative sign does. The negative sign causes our graph to open down, which means we had a vertical reflection. The three, three is greater than one, so it causes our graph to get skinnier, which is a vertical stretch. 
So if you had both of those things, those were from section 8.1. Nice review opportunity. Then last but not least, we are subtracting 2 from our squared term. So there's our vertical translation. And since we're subtracting, we're moving down, and we're moving down 2. Again, if you didn't have the vertical translation piece, if all you put was down 2, that's perfectly fine. Last but not least, question 4. We have 1 half times our x squared. 1 half is smaller than 1, so it causes a vertical shrink. Or again, if you prefer the word compression instead of shrink, that's fine. Then we have, we're subtracting 4, so we do have a vertical translation. We need to be specific that we move down 4. Again, if you want to simplify it, I'm fine if you just tell me that it moved down 4. No big deal. I didn't want to take the time for us to graph all of these, but what I would like to do in question 4 is just show you a little bit with the order of operations. If you're substituting in, let's say we're going to substitute, let's put 2 in for x. Now, I know all of us are very familiar with substituting a value in for a variable. Then from here, though, we do have to stop and remember our order of operations. That's why I want to take just a little bit of time here and put a couple of values in for x into number 4. We have to make sure that we do our exponents first. So the 1 half stays put. We square the 2, and everything else stays the same. Now we want to multiply half times 4, so half of 4 is 2. Then we want to do our subtracting. Let's try another value. Let's go ahead and put, let's put, uh, let's do negative 3 in for x. And I'm just picking some random numbers here just so we can focus on our order of operations. That's going to be very key for us in getting the correct graph. Again, exponents first. When I square a negative, I do get a positive result. Also, keep in mind, I know a lot of you will probably try this without your calculator, so make sure that when you square a number, for example, this means negative 3 times negative 3. It's not negative 3 times 2. Just be very careful with that, especially if you're not using your calculator and just doing the computation in your head. That's totally fine. Now, I realize half of 9, that's not quite as simple. That's okay for me to say half of 9. If you need to put in your calculator, that's fine. Is 4 and a half. 4 and a half minus 4, that's okay. My end result, I end up with a half. So if we were to graph those couple pairs, and we're not going to make a parabola out of this. If I graph the point 2, negative 2, there's where I end up. Negative 3, 1 half. I really wanted to show you guys this one. Negative 3, and then I go up half of a box. I know we saw some fractions in 8.1, so I just want to take a little bit of time to show you another ordered pair that had a fraction for one of the coordinates. So we go negative 3 on the x, and then just up half a box on the y. Now, my intent here was not to graph this complete parabola. My intent here was just to show you, if you substitute a value in, how you work your way through those order of operations to get the matching y value for your x. And to also just remind you of how we graph if we have a fraction as one of our coordinates. So now you may move on to your progress check and you may use these notes on your progress check.